What's good, guys? Welcome back to my channel where I help you to love the scriptures and to reform back to the word of God. If this is your first time here, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. And do me a favor and smash the like button. And as you guys can see, I got my brother with me, one of my best friends, Joshua Janier. He is a student at Reformation Bible College. He is one of the best theologians in our generation. You guys know him. He's been here many times before, maybe almost at least eight times on this channel. Um, so you guys know who he is, amazing man of the Lord. So just say hi to the people and then we're gonna get right into it. What's up guys? Hope you guys are doing well. Hope this video blesses you. Yeah, and I'm gonna put some of his stuff in the description. He writes papers and articles and uh, he has a YouTube channel. And so I'm gonna put that in the description. Uh, and as you guys can see, this is a Christmas special that we're doing here today. We're going to be speaking about the incarnation of the Son of God, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Because when we talk about Christmas, this is what as we as Christians should be focused on. Uh, the person of Jesus Christ, is, is uh, specifically his incarnation. Uh, so before we even get to talking, let's open up the word to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 speaks of this wonderful reality of the incarnation and what we are talking about when we're speaking of Christmas, what we celebrate in Christmas. So Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, this is what it says. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince, of peace. So the first line in that verse, we see it says, For unto us a child is born. A child, that word presupposes humanity. To be a child, you must be a human. You must have human nature. For unto us a child is born. To be born, you must be human. A child being born is a human. But we see later on, I'm going to skip where the, 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 the titles of one wonderful counselor, I'm going to go right to mighty God. It says that he is mighty God. So we see this amazing paradox and mysterious thing where a child, like I said, who is a human is also called mighty God. How can this be? Because we know that to be divine, you cannot be created. But the world the word child presupposes creation so if you can reconcile that for us in your best way possible because this is a topic that is very mysterious in nature it's very profound very amazing um, beautiful when you come to understand what isaiah 9 6 unto us a child is born and he is also mighty god yeah i think uh i guess the first thing just to pivot just to piggyback on what you're saying just the, the paradoxical nature of right you know humanity and divinity right you know a divine name being predicated to someone who is human you know how do we reconcile that <clears throat> and i think when we do theology especially when we talk about you know our you know our theological topics like such christology we have to acknowledge the distinction between creator and creature there's such things, even though revelation comes to us that we may know God and love him, there's things contained in sacred scripture that we will never exhaust the bounds of. And this is commonly what the Reformed Orthodox called the distinction between ectypal and archetypal theology. And having established that, now we can talk about this paradoxical nature of Jesus being divine and human. So what we say is that when the person of the Son of God was sent into the world, right, the person of the Son of God has, of course, his nature, his divine nature, that which is common to all three persons, and that is united to a human nature. So, and this, and we're going to talk about the Chalcedonian Creed, this union is done without mixture, without confusion, without confounding, but the two natures are united to the one person of the mediator or of the son. And, <clears throat> and I think that's just, just distinguishing the natures, know, knowing that, the, that the, the human does not blend with the divine, the sure. divine does not blend with the human, just establishing those distinctions are really, really necessary for us to understand, you know, the miracles of Christ, the knowledge of Christ, the will of Christ, et cetera, et cetera. And also just understanding 
um, the person of the son, because the person of the son assumes a human nature. Um, and of course, you know, prior to that, he has the divine, the divine nature, that which is common to all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So can you speak to how this possible, how this reality spoken of in Isaiah 9, 6, a child is born, he is mm -hmm. called mighty God. Can you speak to how that is even a possibility? If it's even scientifically possible, because we're dabbling into speaking of the hypostatic union, because we have uh, opposers of the faith who say that the hypostatic union and the incarnation, the word mm -hmm. God, divinity taking on flesh, is impossible and then you have later on in the history of a church in the early stages of the church where apollinarianism rises and you have people because they're trying to defend the divinity of christ diminish the reality of his humanity because they can't possibly conceive mm -hmm. how these things could be simultaneously true where you have a human who takes i mean a, a, a divine being who takes mm -hmm. on human nature so mm -hmm. if you to how that's even possible yeah, I think uh, it's possible for the, the Son of God to become incarnate, and it's only possible for the Son of God to become incarnate because of just the divine, you know, the economy of salvation, right? Um, classically, if you read treatments on the and incarnate... Right, before it even continues, when we speak about the economy of salvation, we're talking about how the triune God mm -hmm. operates and works in creation, providence, and in redemption, just to mm -hmm. clarify, so you don't get yeah. The economy of salvation and the economic trinity has to deal with how the triune God deals in history and how he works in redemptive history. Mm -hmm. And when we, the, the, when we talk about the imminent trinity, that's how God, that's who God is in and of himself, mm -hmm. ontologically by nature. I just wanted to make yeah. that because he's going to use that word a lot in this video, but I want yeah. to know what that means. So economic trinity. And, and to what you said, understanding the economic trinity you cannot understand the economic trinity without the imminent trinity, right? <clears throat> because the economic trinity presupposes an order of origin. The reason why the father cannot become incarnate is because the father is the principle of the trinity, right? The father is from no one, right? He is of himself, right? The son is begotten of the father. The reason why the Holy Spirit cannot you know, become incarnate is because the Holy Spirit is sent from the principle of the father and the son. So therefore, it is only requisite that the second person of the Trinity become the God-man um, because he is sent from the Father. And then, of course, in the economy of salvation, after the objective sending of the Son, there is the objective sending of the Spirit from just not the Father, you know, contrary to what the Greek Orthodox believe, but from the Father and the Son. And that's so, just... Yeah, the that's just confessional yeah. credulistic language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and you know the right and this is right the reason yeah the reason why the son can become incarnate is because he's from the father because the the son is principled from the father um and when the father works in the economic trinity he works of himself through the son and you know the father and the son work through the spirit so I think that that really just, just grounds us for <clears throat> the possibility of the incarnation and how God can become a man, but because, right, the order of subsistence, the father being of himself, the son being begotten of the father, and the spirit proceeding from the principle of the father and the son, that really grounds the possibility of the incarnation of the son of God. And that's why, right, orthodox treatments on Christology, they're going to acknowledge that it is only possible for the Son of God to become incarnate um, because the Father cannot be sent by the Son. It would just just mess up with the, the persons according to their mode of subsistence. And yeah, I think that grounds the, the possibility of the incarnation of the Son of God. Speaking of that, I want to take you to the Westminster Larger Catechism. Mm. Question and answer number 37, where it speaks to what I just asked. How did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? And you can elaborate a little bit on this. The answer is Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, and born of her, yet without mm. sin. 
so elaborate on that. And I want to take uh, uh, question 38 as well. But yeah. question 37 of the Westminster Larger Catechism is crucial in understanding the incarnation. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's such a good question. And, you know, why, you know, when we talk about you know, what, what is the mode of salvation? Why is it necessary that somebody comes and assumes human flesh, right? Mm -hmm. So having established that it is only possible that the son of God could become incarnate, why is it necessary for him to become incarnate, incarnate, right? Carne coming from the Latin flesh. Um, why is it necessary that the son of God take on human flesh, a body, a soul, and a mind? He's taking on himself a true body, a reasonable soul. <clears throat> yeah, just, just in, in there, I think the reason why the divine said true is, you know, if Jesus does not take on a true human nature, you know, and this just goes back to what the patristics and the Cappadocians said, you know, con, you know, when refuting the Arians, the Manichaeans, you know, that which is not assumed cannot be redeemed, right? If Christ does not assume a human soul, a human body, and a human mind, he cannot redeem us, right? right? Because of the fall of man, because of the fall of Adam, and, you know, our fault, we are, we find ourselves in a state of sin and misery. It is requisite that just, it's not just, it's body, soul, and mind that need to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the mediator must assume a true body, a true soul and a true mind because those are the faculties of human nature that needs redemption and that that's really why why the divines and you know chalcedon um nicaea and just you know high medieval treatments and reformed orthodox treatments are going to emphasize that word true veritas like he takes on a true human nature because you know you know, contrary to the Arians, that Christ is just this human being, that is the highest human being, you know, if Christ is just a human being, if the divine does not, perf the divine must take on the human nature, because divinity perfects human nature, um, and we are, we are, you know, perfection and redemption is necessary because of the fall of man, um, and yeah, that's, that's really, that's why, that, speaking yeah. real quick, because you, you what now we're transitioning to the necessity of the incarnation right mm -hmm. we talked about first how did christ become incarnate number two is the necessity of the incarnation um it's because like you said the fall of man sin entered into the world and but the key mm -hmm. word is man it was the fall mm -hmm. of man and now redemption has to be possible and has to come from a man and we see mm -hmm. you know, i just read in and the West Prince Logic Catechism, question and answer number 37. But we see in Hebrews chapter 2, where in verse 14 it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Why did he partake of the same thing? So that he so it could be possible for him to die. Because when mm -hmm. we speak of Jesus and, and Orthodox Christology, we speak of Jesus being the word of God, being God's agent of creation. That, that mm -hmm. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 that he was part of creation. John chapter 1, that he was part mm -hmm. of creation. The only, you can only be part of creation if you are divine. Jesus was God. Jesus is deity. Uh, but So he is not able to die. He does not have the possibility to die. If you are divine, you cannot die. That, um, Theology 101, theology proper 101. The, this is the, the, the reality that if you are God, you are eternal. There is no possibility of death within you. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why the incarnation was necessary was so that Jesus could die on behalf of man. Mm -hmm. This is why I said he partook of, partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death that is the devil, if you want to continue to speak about the necessity of the incarnation. Yeah. And yeah, just the necessity of the incarnation goes back to what I just said previously, just the reality of the fall of man, <clears throat> you know, you know, Adam found him, you know, and, and this is like tr traditionally when we talk about uh, the, the necessity of the incarnation, we talk about whether or not it was requisite that the mediator become incarnate if man had not sinned. I think I can't really say, I, I, I guess for myself, I can speak dogmatically that I do not believe if Adam had not sinned, it was requisite for the mediator to become, you know, you know, 
incarnate, but there's, you know, high medievals like William of Ockham who believe that it was requisite that the mediator become incarnate if man had not sinned. And then we also talk about, was it necessary for specifically the son of God to become incarnate? And I think we've, we've treated that, that it is only possible that the son of God be sent because, because it is consistent with his motive, mode of subsistence in the imminent Trinity. And then um, the third, was it necessary that God, right, that, that, our medi- that the mediator be a God man? And I think that's what you're talking about. And yes, it is necessary for God to become incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, because, right, all men descend from Adam, right? All men have sin. So therefore, it is impossible for one man who descends from Adam, right, according to ordinary generation, right, to take on the sin of the world because he has his own sin to, right, um, to atone for. But the Son of God, who descends from Adam via non-ordinary generation because of the, the, the miraculous birth, the virgin birth, it is possible for him to take yeah. on the sin of his people, right, the elect, or we can say the world, right, it is possible for the son of God to take the sins of the world because he descends via non-ordinary generation, right? He is not, he, Christ does not have original sin, right? He has a true human soul, body, and mind, but without sin, he assumes a, a perfect human nature. And, but, but and why is it requisite that God become incarnate? Because God is the one who saves sinners. Before you forget to that, about this. Yeah. I want to say this before I even forget. And, you brought up something very important, very crucial to understand the incarnation mm-hmm. is the necessity of the virgin birth, the, the miraculous nature of Jesus's birth. That's necessary mm-hmm. because like he said, why was it even requisite? Why was it even ne- necessary for Jesus to become man? It's because the fall of man through humanity's federal head, Adam. We see Paul say in Romans chapter five, that all men died in Adam, that because of Adam's original sin, all men inherited a sinful nature. All of Adam's posterity inherits a sinful nature. This is why David says in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, mm-hmm. We are we inherit a sinful nature from Adam. And this is why it's important that Jesus did not have an earthly father, that Jesus is generated from all eternity, from the essence of the father, conceived by one who is divine, the Holy Spirit, and born not of, like you said, not of ordinary generation. He's not born. He wasn't begotten like we are. He's begun unordinarily. He was born of a virgin. So he does not descend from Adam in the way that we do. He descends from Adam unordinarily. Um, and that's important mm-hmm. because if he descended from Adam the same way that we did, we would be going to hell right now because he would have to have the, uh, inherited a sinful nature as well. But because of the reality of the virgin birth, he did not descend from Adam the way we do. He's not generated the way we are generated. Um, that's important in understanding the incarnation that Jesus is sinless. Uh, he has to be sinless. Um, in order yeah to- yeah and, and back to back to you know why was it requisite that that our mediator be a god man right yeah. it's it's necessary for the mediator to be man because god is eternal right mm-hmm. and then this just goes back to the two natures of christ and then there's there's categories that we can work with that we can talk about another time right but god uh right so it was it was requisite that christ take on flesh because Christ, according to his essence, is eternal, right? So therefore, right, you know, God cannot be subject to to death. But it was requisite that the mediator be God, because God is the only one who can vanquish death. Mm -hmm. So there's, and so there's necessities on both sides, on the divine Mm -hmm. side, Mm -hmm. you know, that which is divine, only, only God can vanquish death, right? You know, 1 Corinthians 15, right? Christ has overcome death. He has overcome the grave. You know, he, you know, the grave was, you know, his, he was just, he could not be held by the grave. Um, and why, why does it say that? Because he is the God man, only God can vanquish death, death, but Christ, according to his human nature, he is the only one who can receive, you know, death, right? Of course, you know, you know, natures are the ones who act and we predicate those actions to person, Right, we don't make the Nestorian. We don't make the Nestorian error, right? Yeah. But, right, Christ can only act accordingly to his natures, 
right? So there's, there's things that only the divine nature can do, such as vanquish death. And there's things only that the human nature can do, such as die. So that's why it's necessary for the mediator to be a God man. If when we talk about our redemption, part of our redemption is our glorification, right? You know, we, we are, there is no, no more death. And only God can do that. So these divine benefits that we receive, you know, these are works of God mm -hmm. um, because only God can do these things. Only God can save sinners, um, but only man can die. So that's why it's necessary yeah. that Christ assume. And, and speaking of that, I want to quote Athanasius. Um, it's important mm -hmm. that we are in line with the universal church when we're speaking mm -hmm. of these things, these things of importance, these things of essentiality. Uh, in his book on the incarnation, Athanasius, I'm going to just quote him. I'm just going to read him. And he's speaking of what Joshua just said, that uh, it's only God that can save, but it's only man that can die. And this is why the incarnation is absolutely necessary. Athanasius says this in his book on the incarnation. He says, thus taking a body like our own, because all our bodies were liable to the corruption of death, he surrendered his body to death instead of all and offered it to the father. This he did out of sheer love for us so that in his death, he all might die and the law of death thereby be abolished because having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was therefore voided of his power for men. This he did that he might turn again to incorruption men who had turned back to corruption and make them alive through death by the appropriation of his body and by the grace of his resurrection, thus he can make death to disappear from them as utterly as straw from fire. And there's another quote he says, you know how it is when some great king enters a large city and dwells in one of its houses. Because of his dwelling in that single house, the whole city is honored and enemies and robbers cease to molest it. Even so it is with the king of all. He has come into our country and dwelt in one body amidst the many. And in consequence, the designs of the enemy against mankind have been foiled and the corruption of death, which formerly held them in its power, has simply ceased to be. For the human race would have perished utterly had not the Lord and Savior of all, the Son of God, come among us to put an end to death. And what Athanasius is saying there is what we just said, that he is God. As God, he cannot die, but it is only God that can save. But as So how is he supposed to save us if he can't die? So he assumes uh, a human body. Athanasius says a lot. The word of God, the wisdom of God, uh, assumed a human body that he might die on behalf of those who were supposed to die because of the law of death. Mm. Um, yeah beautiful and, really good. And, and one of the things and one of the things athanasius po pushes as the motif of the incarnation is love mm -hmm. one of the motifs of the incarnation is love that he says out of sheer love he did this assumed the human body so that he might eradicate the power of death in our lives and as the author of the book of hebrews says he 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 he, he strips the one who has the power of death in his uh, in his death on the cross he he eradicates fear of death in the christian's life yeah. through his death and how could he do that by taking on human flesh being the god man as god he can save as man he can die yeah i think i just think of uh one of uh, i just think i think maybe like the best reformational document is the heidelberg catechism of just how it brings true. comfort Westminster. <laughs> Westminster. <laughs> just how it brings comfort to the christian life um i think of heidelberg catechism question answer one you know you know what is your only comfort of life and in death that i am not my own but the long body and soul you know christ takes on body and soul um in life and in death to my faithful savior jesus christ um who has set me free from the you know the tyranny of the devil um and that's what christ does um by taking on human flesh.